Welcome to the Star Girls podcast, the self-publishing podcast for authors. You're in the right place for the best writing, marketing and publishing advice, plus interviews with industry experts and best-selling authors. I'm Cheryl Phipps. I'm Wendy Vella. And I'm Trudy J. And this week we have Caitlin Duncan with us. Hello, Caitlin. Yay. Welcome, Caitlin. Hi. Thanks Welcome. for having me. Welcome to the spa. <laughs> um, now, Caitlin's going to talk to us about hybrid publishing, maybe a bit of ghost writing, and being a mum author um, and how yeah. to control the chaos. Um, if we can squeeze all that information into yeah, one, that's a lot. <laughs> one quick episode. Um, but I'm going to read Caitlin's uh, bio first, and then we'll get right into the uh, interview. So, Caitlin Duncan is a multi published author of adult and young author fiction and has ghost written over 40 novels for children and adults. When she's not writing, she's obsessing over her many, many television series and hanging out on YouTube where she shares her writing process and all things bookish. Hello. Welcome. There you go. <laughs> so, Caitlin, can you Hello. give us your um your how you got into writing, how you got into self-publishing, your origin story, if you will? Go. Absolutely. Um, again, thanks for having me. Um, so my publication journey began in 2012. I received a contract uh, with Karina UK, which was a digital first imprint of, of Harlequin UK. Um, I answered, they were had a call for unagented submissions. I've never had an agent. Um, so I sort of came in that way. And they turned my one book that I submitted into a series. And from then on, I published... 13 books with them. Um, eventually they were bought out by HarperCollins. So um, some of my books are still with HarperCollins. And when it came to indie publishing, I realized closer to 2020 that I wasn't really writing what I wanted to write. And I felt like I had enough experience um, sort of to be, be able to go off on my own. I also received the rights back to that first book or that first series. And I was suddenly faced with, I have this manuscript and it's pretty, you know, clean. Um, and I wanted to republish it. Um, so I looked everywhere to see like how to do this, like how to republish things, because as a trad author, I was sort of uh, shepherded through the process. Um, so I didn't do my own covers. I didn't do my own, you know, I edited, but I edited with someone. I didn't have to hire anyone. Um, so I started asking other people what they did uh, with rights reversion and, you know, self-publishing. Um, and then I decided to create my own resource. So I wrote, take back your book, an author's guide to rights reversion and publishing on your terms. It's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> but that was the first book that I self-published and I, I caught the bug. It was so fun to sort of have my hand in every aspect of the publishing process. And then I self-published that book again, Soul Taken. Um, and actually won an award last year, which was really fun oh, um, and sort of rewarding. Yeah. Um, and then I've just sort of been self-publishing and that's sort of my path at this point moving forward. Nice. So did you, was Soul Taken, so that was the first book in the series that you had the rights yes. first book. Did you keep the same name and keep the same author name? Like that, it was all just the same, you just republished it under your own steam? Yeah, so I actually used a pen name for republishing it because I made that mistake of having all of my books under my name, which really caused a lot of confusion for the distributors and like I said, I, did, I didn't have an agent and I really didn't have a lot of guidance. Um, so I just sort of did that. So course correcting now, I I have my self-published um, young adult books under Katie Duncan, K-A-T-Y, uh, my nonfiction and some of my um, current women's fiction with HarperCollins is under Caitlin Duncan. And then my thrillers are Caitlin, and, uh, Caitlin L. Duncan. Um, so yeah, I sort of separated myself out there uh, moving forward. Yeah, that makes sense. So do you do any trad publishing um, these days at all? Or are you still, so it's mainly those nope. original? Yes. Yeah. So I have um, women's fiction um, wrapped up for Christmas, Barefoot on the Beach, and also um, more of a contemporary fantasy, um, Secrets at Mermaid's Cove, that was just repackaged. Um, it was a series of novellas. Um, and then a couple other young adult books. 
And those have to stay, you know, as is, but mm-hmm. moving forward as things do revert back to me, I'm, you know, trying to segment myself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Awesome. So if we start in on uh, talking a little bit about hybrid publishing, what, mm-hmm. what would you say the definition of hybrid publishing is? Um, in the context of my second uh, nonfiction book, The Successful Hybrid Author, it is an author who has had or currently is in a traditional contract. And that can be with, you know, a big publisher, big New York publisher, a small press, anything like that. And also has or is currently self-publishing. So it's like a foot in both worlds, but it can be so many different ways. Mm-hmm. So you could be like me who's transitioned over. Some people are still doing both. Some people, some self-published authors have sold, you know, foreign translations and things like that. So they do have a contract or audiobooks with sub rights. Um, mm-hmm. So it's just at some point having a contract and at some point self-publishing, yeah. um, you're sort of that kind of hybrid. Okay, that's awesome. And so what are, what would you say are the benefits to being a hybrid author? Like why would people choose to be hybrid? There's definitely pros and cons with the two processes of traditional publishing and self-publishing. And, and through becoming a hybrid author, you sort of can weave your own path um, where you can. So for instance, traditional publishers, especially the big five, um, they they have a lot of experience behind them. You don't have to pay to have your book published, um, but also there's less control. Whereas self-publishing, you have a lot of control, but also have to spend you know, quite a sum of money to publish your book typically. Um, So, but you can also, you know, exercise that control with, you know, paid advertising or even just marketing your books. So it's sort of like picking and choosing from a catalog, like which things you want per book. Um, So yeah, definitely. So if you're traditionally published and you're a um you don't do the advertising for your book, is that right? Or can you advertise your traditional publishing books too, like you would if you were self-publishing? Is that is that how you see that? Well, you can. Um, typically, the publisher will have some sort of marketing plan for you. So that doesn't always include paid advertising. Um, but the thing about paid advertising with a traditional contract is that you're only getting a percentage of your royalties. So the publisher is still, you know, you're putting out all this money and they're making their cut and you're making your cut. And then if you have an agent, they get their cut. So for me, when I did that for a little bit um, for my women's fiction books, I just didn't um, see the benefit of it for myself, but you absolutely can. And I believe Amazon now allows you to do that with trad books. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So that is something you have to take into account, the fact that it's almost you've got to be even better at the advertising, the paid advertising, Mm -hmm. to kind of make it worth your while. Um, Otherwise, you're just making a whole bunch of extra money for the publisher and your agent, potentially. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I haven't thought about that. I mean, if the book goes well, traditional published, obviously, they're going to push it, right? Um, oh yeah I mean, mm-hmm. you know that that's okay so I I my first book was traditionally published and they really didn't touch it until my other book started to go well and then they were quite happy to to push it a bit you know mm-hmm. so there's, yeah there's that your self-published of, books went well and yeah sorry my self-published books as well and then they, they jumped on the thread <laughs> oh and, nice and pushed that one yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so so, so they're happily keeping a hold of that one Wendy, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they are. So I, you know, you can see the benefits of hybrid publishing because it is a lot, a lot of work, isn't it? Self-publishing. Yes. Um, and you yeah. know, I, I, you know, I mean, you're running your own publishing house, so they having to have someone to take that, 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 you know, stress away from you. But like you say, it's sort of a swing and roundabouts, isn't it? Because you're going to lose money in what you get in your royalties, mm-hmm. but they do more for you. Yeah. So I guess. Yeah, and it's the it. control too. I mean, yeah. I've. I've had issues with, well, not liking my covers. Yeah. It, people I've dealt with didn't really care. Um, so, you know, I didn't get to choose a lot. Eventually, though, since I had published for a long time with them, I did have a little more say in sort of like back cover blurbs and things like that as I was trying to figure out, you know, marketing mm-hmm. and everything. So, yeah. you know, it just depends on the relationship. And it was just um, not for me at the time anymore. Yeah. I yeah. suppose if you're a new author, you don't get quite as much say too, do you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's a point. 
because it, it's it's kind of it can be all sorts of different ways they're kind of like you can um hybrid publishing could be you're an experienced self-publisher and someone comes and offers you a print deal or mm-hmm. you know for one series you, you could have more or less control you might you know like it it can be all sorts of different um options yeah. um yes. as, as part of that and different benefits to to different people um Absolutely. so and sorry you go so let's talk about pen names. So you chose to have three different pen names for um, your three different sort of genres. Um, can you tell mm-hmm. us a bit about that? Did you, what did you, so you found it that it was a mistake to keep your same name for, for all the different books? Well, for me, it was a mistake because I was publishing young adult paranormal, uh, young adult thrillers. I had some adult mixed in there um, and then my nonfiction. So it just, became very difficult to sort of find my my audience um you know there's some that sort of cascade all the genres but typically when people are looking at bookstores like they just know what they like um so i wanted to separate them as they were reverted back to me uh, just so that you know you pick up a katie duncan book and you're getting you know young adult coming of age paranormal um and then caitlin l duncan for psychological thrillers so um you know you really can take it really far I still have one website I just didn't find it um worth it in time and money to invest in like three different websites and handling three different platforms so I'm still working on it uh, yeah. let's just say that <laughs> and I <What> ask <laughs> yes the fact that you have written such a variety how did that come about? Because we know that that is actually just making life hard for yourself, right? <laughs> yes. In different genres. So yes. what what led to all of that? <laughs> and she says that with so, kindness because she's written lots of different genres herself. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No worries. Um, yeah, so the reason I think I did that, one, I think I just didn't have enough industry experience early on. So I got accepted to um, Karina UK with a young adult paranormal and they Mm. were starting, they were just starting off. So they had all these different genres and eventually they sort of funneled into, you know, what they publish now. So I was sort of encouraged to try different genres, like whatever Mm. idea I had at the time, they're like, oh yeah, let's write that because digital first publishing, they can get it out, you know, in six months Mm -hmm. versus the traditional path of, um, you know, 18 months to two years to do like all the hardcovers and paperbacks and stuff like that. So I was sort of experimenting and then I caught up with myself and realized that like not everyone's going to read all my genres. Um, I still love the books, but I just think they're better off under like in their own in their own lanes. Are you still trying to write for each of those or is there a, is there a particular genre that you focused on more now? Now I'm just focusing on um, psychological thrillers. I'm going to mm-hmm. continue to write nonfiction um, for publishing uh, publishing industry specific things, um, and I do want to at least get the last two books out in that the Life After series that Soul Taken was the first one, mm-hmm. um, just to have all of them in a package. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Nice. That's awesome. Okay, so um, and. How do you market them? Do you do you do anything to your tr- traditional books at all, or like are you mentioning them on social media or anything like that, or you just? Um, I I don't. I mean, you know, around the Christmas season, I'll bring it up for like my newsletter, um, and in the summertime because Barefoot on the Beach is more of a summer romance, but um, I don't, um, because they've been out for a couple of years now and you know, for me to back it without the trad publisher backing it, it's just, I have other lanes to kind of sit in (laughs) when it comes to my self-published books. Cause I get, I make more when I sell those ones than, than my trad Mm. books. Yeah, sure. And so what do you do for your, um, your, sorry, Wendy, for your hybrid, uh, for your self-published books, you've got a newsletter. Do you do paid advertising? Do you have, um, social media? Yeah, I don't do paid advertising. I I haven't dabbled in that because I'm not a risk taker. Uh, and I just, um, I also work full time. So like I'm sort of trying to figure everything out. But with my psychological thriller, I do a lot of local events um, in my area. And I work with local bookstores and libraries. And um, I'm sort of 
you know, boots to the ground sort of with that book. Um, I have three more sort of planned out. So I want to start, you know, expanding that, but we have a really rich um, community here for like creatives. Um, and it's really nice to sort of be a part of that. Um, with Soul Taken, I am going to wait until I have all three books out um, to do some advertising to, you know, get everyone through the series. Um, and my nonfiction is really, it's very niche. Um, I tend to do a lot of niche things. So the people who love Take Back Your Book and the successful hybrid author, like it's a lot of word of mouth, which is fantastic um, because that's where a lot of people hear about those books. So as much as I can, being a mom, full-time, you know, project manager and a writer, I just, I do the best I can with marketing. Wow, you've got a lot of balls in the air. Yeah, 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 it's a big job. yeah I do. <laughs> So, and that's an interesting one that I was thinking that um, the first book that you did, the the Take Back Your Rights one, that'd be quite, be a lot of people out there maybe who are, have got books that are kind of languishing yeah. with trade publishers yeah. and don't know how to get them back. So that's a really useful one for them to kind yes. of look up. Um, do you have any kind of quick tips for people if they're, they've got a book that they want to try and get back go, aside from go buy your book? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So I would say the first um, step is to look at your contract because they're all different different. I have looked at many contracts in my um, research and I mean, they vary so, so widely, like even the four contracts I've signed are all different. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely look at your contract and typically there is a date. So um, for example, if the, the contract states after seven years of publication, if your book is not making any more than say $250 per royalty or per 12 months, you have to look at those numbers. So you have to go back and look at your royalty reports um, and make sure you're within the, the request date and threshold. Um, and then it can be as simple as writing an email and just saying, you know, these, this is the evidence I have that I, you know, want my rights back. And then the publisher sort of has to figure out if they want to keep marketing it or if they want to give you the rights back. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of like a quick, quick, quick process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. I've been waiting now for like close to a year <laughs> for someone <laughs> to get back to me. It's a slow oh, process geez. for sure. Yeah. yeah. They don't want to give it, it up. Can be. <laughs> they don't want no, to give it up. clearly not. Clearly not. Do you, do you yeah. think traditional publishers like to work with authors that are self-published as well? Do you think they have an issue with that? Um, I don't know. I mean, I can't speak for them, but I mean, I don't think they would, especially if you are a self-published author who has an audience, like when you have a built-in audience, that's very, you know, yeah. helpful um, yeah. for them. So, but I don't know if there, there's a preference at all, really. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think there's a lot of hybrid authors out there? Do you think that? Yeah, I yeah, think so. Are. In, in, my research, because what I like to do with my nonfiction is sort of give my process, but also I like to interview people. Yeah. Um, so on my channel, I um, interviewed, well, I have snippets from it. I interviewed Gail Carriger, um, Rachel Heron, uh, Helen Schroyer, and Sasha Black. Um, so those are some case studies of like really in-depth conversations. And yeah. through all of those authors um you know some people have come forward and some people you know it's not anything that people really shout about a lot mm. um but it's interesting when I find someone who is yeah. doing yeah. both yeah yeah cool it's an interesting thing it's sort of I don't know it's it used to be for a while there like like a very big thing like people were kind of like hybrid is the way to go like you can kind of have a foot in mm -hmm. both camps kind of thing I you don't hear about it quite so much anymore do you find or do you think maybe it's just that people are quiet about it like you say yeah I I just think that um no one really talks about it like just to talk about it um yeah. throughout my 10 plus years of publishing I've become sort of someone who just wants to open the doors um uh, because with trad's specifically there's a lot of stuff that happens behind the scenes that no one talks about um which and i don't know if it's because they don't want to you know ruin the relationship or if it's they don't want to complain because they've been given a contract but um i just try to be as open as i can and offer information on both sides and people can make their own decisions because i sort of 
did not have that for myself. Um, so I do appreciate, um, sharing as much as I can, maybe too much sometimes, but, um, I love the conversations with authors and I just, that's something I like to do on my YouTube channel too, is just sort of let it all out there. (laughs) It is a great community for that as a whole, isn't it? There are a lot of Facebook groups and that people, experienced authors who will share that information. If you, yes. You know, Mm -hmm. I, yeah. If you ask. Yeah. If you ask, we've always found that with guests. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Definitely. So I have a question that I'm curious about. Do you feel like you write differently when you're writing for trad versus indie? Do you think there was a different style or, or is it just the same books, just different people publishing them? Um, I think my writing process is pretty the same. Um, I know that there are a lot more conversations about my book um, with my editor because they're sort of, um mark there's they're marketing at the same time when they do edit so they know what things are selling um which can be valuable um but it can also shift the way that the story might have gone if i self-published it so i think the writing is the same but sort of the thinking about it in the process um is a little different when i'm working with a trad house yeah yeah that's interesting that's cool (laughs) Again, that control freak thing, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. um, so now, so you said that you're a project manager and, and you've got a course on time management for author mums. That's me mm-hmm. um, <laughs> squeezing that down into one sentence. Um, it's called From Chaos to Control. So I'm really curious, what is, um, can you talk to us about that? Like, like, um, so you obviously got a, a, a daughter that you need to wrangle plus a full-time job plus your writing. Yes. So can mm-hmm. you talk to us about some of the things that you do for that to, to make that work for you? Um, without yeah, reason? absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I found that um, when COVID hit specifically, when we were shut down, um, I backed out of being at work and I stayed home and I, I was diagnosed adult ADHD and we have problems with, um, well, at least for me specifically, I have problems with executive function and sort of like looking at time. So I just felt completely lost without sort of having that like schedule of go to school, go to work. And a lot of things came from that, that were like very negative. Like I was very overwhelmed, depressed at times. And I sort of had to figure out it out. Um, and I went back, you know, to sort of making schedules for myself, like I would, if I was at work. So if I was at work, I'd be doing these things. So I, you know, did time blocking. I think I've done every single productivity thing out there (laughs) um, to try to figure out what works for me. And then within, um, you know, speaking like, uh, me and Sasha, well, we've been doing sprints for like three years um, in the morning. So she's in the UK and, you know, I'm up, up at 5 a.m. Um, so we talked a lot about uh, being a mom during that time and everything. So the course um, sort of came from, again, very niche, but it sort of came from feeling overwhelmed and overworked. And I just want to share all of the things that I know with other author moms, because I, during the process of creating the course, I spoke with over 50 author moms. um, And like, it can range from like people who are killing it to people who can't even like write anymore because everything is just so chaotic. Mm -hmm. So um, I just, that course sort of came out of me wanting to share and wanting to help, um, you know, having that creative part of you flourish along with being able to handle the day-to-day uh, with your family and also have you time, um, which was something that I never gave myself. And I could see points in my life when I didn't do that, how it affected me like very negatively. Um, and now that I sort of implemented this process for myself, you know, there's, I can't do everything, but I do the things that I want to do and that fulfill me. Um, and I don't, I protect it a lot. Um, I protect my myself and my boundaries and therapy certainly helped with uh, <laughs> with all that stuff too. So <laughs> yeah, no, that's cool. Very that's cool. awesome. Yeah. So, so yeah, what are some, 
yeah well done um, what are some of your like your top kind of time management thing like what is the one thing that you do that that helps you the most we're gonna um I would say my calendar mm-hmm. is like and I I've been through different ways and and I sort of go through this in the course too is like sort of time blocking but um I don't like to give exact concrete you have to do this you have to do that like I try to work with with you um with my you know author moms in there so I do you offer like coaching to if they get stuck. Um, but I would say like knowing how much time you have per day and being very realistic about what you can accomplish while maintaining your mental and physical health. So it's a lot of like, just, just writing down everything you do. And, you know, if I looked at myself two years ago, I don't, like realistically you can't do all of these things, but like I thought I could and I would drive myself crazy. So definitely understanding your time, scheduling out, you know, everything that you do and being realistic and maybe paring down if you need to, um, because we can't do it all, all the time. Yeah. Yeah, And I think that's a, that's a thing that people think that they, they try and do it all and then they end up doing Mm -hmm. nothing and they, and they kind of, and, and that's the, Whereas if you just do a little bit, then you get somewhere. And that's the thing that yeah. you have to get their heads around, I think, before you can kind of actually yeah. get get things done. These I two other the other two are of achievement is it couldn't can't be underestimated, can it? Because no. if you if you can see that you've achieved something, that kind of mm-hmm. inspires you to move on to the next yeah. thing, doesn't it? Rather than get stuck yes. because nothing's exactly mm-hmm. and I think as authors, mm-hmm. we because we are running our own businesses, we tend to do to do so much. And like mm-hmm. you say, it's okay to put something off and it's okay to like, I'm, I'm the worst at it. I just run around doing a whole lot of things half well <laughs> <laughs> and only a few things really well, you know. So yeah. I think that's understanding that in you, isn't it? What what your strengths and weaknesses are as well. Mm. Exactly, yeah. yeah. That's a basic project management thing, isn't it? Like you, you get one project to finish rather than four projects caught away done right like that's actually so yeah you've got, you can be working on four different things but if none of them are finished they're useless to you but if you've finished the whole yeah. of one thing then at least you've got one thing done and yeah move on yeah. to the next yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. and the other thing was you talked about boundaries and that's another interesting one especially when you're a mum um and you don't have any boundaries because your children are just there and want you all the time uh, yeah. someone told me that that's where it, where it works with their children not me clearly <laughs> um, so how do you how do you deal with that like what are some advice pieces of advice you could give for yeah um I mean first of all what I um and again this was something that I discussed with my my therapist is she asked me like what my values are and I don't think anyone has ever asked me that prior so I was like oh And she's like, you know, list your top three values. And I did. And then I sort of saw everything around me that were within those values and things that weren't. And the things that weren't, I let go. Like I just, you know, I can, if I have time, you know, I'll do those things. But when it comes to my values, like my family, so if something is interfering with that, if it's not another value of mine, then I just, I say no. Like my quick response to a lot of requests now is just no initially. And then like, you have to talk me into a yes, because um, (laughs) I have a good understanding of my values. Um, So that's one thing in, in the course, we talk about creating like a personal mission statement and really thinking about your core values. And then if things you know, requests come in, you know, you don't always have to say yes. And that, I mean, I, I was a chronic people pleaser previously and it just, it didn't pay off <laughs> really. Yeah. Um, Cause it just stressed me out even more. And then created that ability for people just to ask, 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 and never like, you know, give. So yeah, I would definitely say understanding your values and aligning any requests um, that come to you with them. Mm. And that's a really big one. And I do it too. It's like when someone asks, I kind of jump to like, try and say, like do things straight away and we'll, and drop something mm-hmm. that I'm doing. That's important to me to do something for them. And, yeah. I, and you kind of have to stop and go, actually, is this the right thing? Yeah. Should I be doing this? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, 
it's hard. It's hard, right? If you're a people pleaser, Mm -hmm. you just want to. It is. Yeah. And, you know, the longer you do that, if you are giving so much of yourself, there's not going to be anything left for creativity or for you. Like, you know, I, there were times that I just didn't, I just felt like I was giving so much and I, you know, it's paralyzing at times um, to keep doing that. So Mm -hmm. To be paralyzing awesome. enough just writing, let alone, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> you don't need to add to it, right? But it's that whole nope. thing of putting yourself first occasionally too, isn't it? I mean, yes. I don't think we do that, you know. I mean, as a no. mom or it's, a, you... a grandmother in my thing, in Cheryl's situation, you just always, like, they ask you for something and you're like, yep. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Of course. Oh, right it. it's... midnight, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah, and then you, you don't sleep. But it's putting the oxygen mask on before – before helping someone else. And, um, I had to learn that the hard way and it's definitely something that I like to share and try to empower other author moms to sort of do for themselves because, um, you know, we we're allowed to do these things for ourselves, and it's okay if, you know, we're sort of quote unquote failing at one Mm. thing when we're succeeding at another, but there's never like an exact balance of everything. Mm. Um, And I think that's important to understand as well. And also the fact that you're actually not asking for permission from anybody to look after Mm -hmm. yourself. You have to give it to yourself, don't you? You, Mm -hmm. It's your responsibility to take care of yourself because if you don't take care of yourself, like with the the oxygen mask analogy, you can't take care of other people. No, exactly. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. You know the truth. That's our number Make one takeaway from this episode. Look after yourselves <laughs> so you can look after other people. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Okay. That's also awesome. before you look after other people, look after mm. yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. And so, do you have any other tips or any other things that, like, you talked about systems and streamlining processes? So, mm-hmm. that's a, so if we're looking after ourselves being an awesome step one, are there, are there any kind of, I don't know, quick fixes? <laughs> Easy one, two, threes. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Two. Um. Yeah. So, like I said, I struggle um with executive function, typically in places I don't want to do the thing. Um. So it's like a motivation thing. So mm-hmm. I found that when I, you know, was looking at self publishing the very first time, I was like, I know I'm gonna have to do this because I've been publishing, you know, for you know many years. So I was like, I know I'm gonna have to do this again. So let's create a system. Let's create a um, sort of an SOP, a standard operating procedures for this thing. Mm-hmm. So I would um, I would just open a Word doc and type in like if I was creating an automated uh, sequence for my mailing list, like I have all of the things that I do. So then the next time that I did it, it took me like half the time, and now it's you know becomes quicker and more efficient. And mm-hmm. I think. When looking at a publishing house as a business, they probably have standard operating procedures Mm. for that reason. And also I look at, as I grow my business, how can I quickly train someone because I don't want to spend six months training someone to to help me out. I already have all this information I can give them and then they can ask me questions, you know, along the way. But I like to for myself when I do, when I do repeatable processes, mostly Um, within publishing I like to just put them in a system and then I can you know access them again later Mm -hmm. Um, so looking at that um, also like automating stuff Um, so like within my life or delegating as well so I delegate you know I have a meal delivery service because I just can't meal plan and I know that about myself so I pick out my meals and it gets delivered and they are delicious um, I also outsource my um, my workouts. So I use Copilot um, app and I find that I work out more because I don't have to look up, you know, all of these workouts or these meal plans and stuff like that. So um, creating systems and then finding opportunities for automation and delegation, I would say are my really top tips. Mm, I, I, oh, like I love that. Awesome. <laughs> I love the fact that your some of your delegation automation is not actually for your writing career. It's for the yeah. other stuff to make mm, it easier yeah. to, to do the writing. And I haven't really thought about that yeah. before. So that's yeah. that's brilliant. I, I do like that. Yeah. I have a robot vacuum as well. That's like my oh, saving grace. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah and right. it's it's so great to see the, like the lines in the carpet and I'm like I didn't have to do it I was working <laughs> I was doing something else <laughs> yes. really, yeah yeah because I don't really. I, I'm still a solopreneur when it comes to my author business mm-hmm. um you know obviously I contract editors and cover designers but I'm sort of building up this system of processes really to yeah. eventually you know hire to a VA or anyone else that I you know, if I don't know something too well and I don't want to learn it like ads, I will I will hire out um for that instance. Yeah. So. And that makes sense because mm-hmm. otherwise you're just chasing your tail, you know, like and you yeah. it, it it frustrates you. I I learned have learned that over the last sort of couple of years that I, I can't do it all and I don't mm-hmm. do it all well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it it affects and but since I've actually hired out a bit more, I'm so much more productive. Mm-hmm. And make so much and more money, right? Too. You, you, you're actually ahead of the game, aren't you? Because you're you're writing all these SOPs yeah. or processes, so that when the time comes, and it will, mm-hmm. you are ahead of the game. You're not yeah. going to have to sit down and go, "Oh, what do I want them to do?" Yeah. Because yeah. yeah, that's a waste of money too. If you're if they're sitting there waiting for you to give them work and exactly. you don't know, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. And we just did that for, um, I just went wide. And so I was just with Amazon. I knew how to load books to Amazon, like the back of my hand, but loading to all the other different um, places. So we created um, SOPs of mm-hmm. exactly what to do. And it took yeah. about half the time it might have done mm-hmm. <laughs> doing it the second yeah. time because we had that, we could just refer back to it and it was a way easier. Mm-hmm. So definitely, yeah. definitely yeah. helps. Yeah, Because often you, you do something and you think you know how to do it and then you, it, you yeah. don't do it for like, five six months or something and you go back to do it and you and you think oh I don't remember yeah. <laughs> it's like creating if you're writing series isn't it like creating a bible of all characters mm, and stuff like yeah. that and not mm-hmm. having to go what's that one's eye color again what's that making yeah. the process is easier on yourself so mm-hmm. that your brain it simplifies like if I've got too much going on my brain's like ah and yeah. if I, mm-hmm. but if I'm calm I can write you know mm, yeah yeah absolutely Already is um anything else that you can add for um benefit of people on from going from chaos to control or should we <laughs> move on to ghostwriting? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's up to you. I mean, I have so many things to discuss <laughs> about productivity. <laughs> it's like my thing, but we could talk about ghostwriting. Oh, no, I want to. I want to talk about productivity. If you've got more that you're having. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, another sort of thing that I talk about. Um. So last year I moved from, we downsized from a a Victorian home um, to a town home. And it was a very emotional move um, for everyone. And we lived in the house for 10 years. So it was like a lot. So I basically took everything from my house and tried to fit it into my town home. <laughs> it didn't work out so well. Um, yeah. So I really have like converted myself to being like a really big declutterer. Um, so I had to declutter so many things. And I found, I literally found time in my day after decluttering. So once I decluttered everything and organized everything, I had a moment of like five, six o'clock after dinner like not having anything else to do because usually that time would be putting away all the the crap that didn't have a place and I didn't like and it was like overwhelming um so I talk about decluttering in in the course too and how important it can be for for writers and creativity to be able to have a clean tidy space of things that you love and things that you use and um that's sort of been my thing where I've literally found time in my day which is which is great and I know other authors could as well if they're not filling it with some of these things that they don't want to be doing mm-hmm. yeah I've, I've, I've discovered decluttering in the last couple of years yeah. and it is I can say that it definitely does help to not that you'd know yeah. it by looking at all my books and all the things on the shelves behind me but yes my house <laughs> is <laughs> much less and it's they're and not it's cluttered not just, they're very organized yeah mm-hmm. yeah not as organized as they're gonna be that's <laughs> um, <laughs> but it is it's not just it's not just decluttering you, you get more time but there's almost like more space in your head do you find that mm-hmm. like like you're not yes. just kind of constantly sort of thinking oh this that then you know it less stuff equals kind of more 
room more mm, space noise. internally inside your head as well as yeah. physically I think that's, that's how it's worked yeah always. definitely like for me it's it's noisy when when mm. I'm in a space whether it's mine or not that's very cluttered mm. um yeah me yeah. too I can't I can't work yeah. like that I can't I can't see a big mess and not want to do something about it I just can't yeah yeah Yes, Cheryl and I are the non-clutter variety. <laughs> no, I can leave a clutter. Setup. It's just noisy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Cheryl's next level, but I'm sort of the level <laughs> below her. <Yeah. laughs> but I don't like clutter at all. I'm quite happy if there's a mess in the cupboards, but not outside. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't want to see it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's an interesting one, actually. And yeah. and I was like, I remember when a few years ago, people started talking about Marie Kondo and, you know, and I was yeah. like, don't start giving away my stuff, <laughs> clutching yeah. things to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I haven't used them away, mate. No one else can do it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Well, Marie Kondo's method, like she's like, don't have books, and I'm like, yeah, what? who are you talking yeah. to? Yeah. Like, something wrong with we that have picture. to have books. <laughs> she's like an alien, you know. Like I mean, I don't even get that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I, I think as an author, when you when you see books, you just get like a hit, don't you? Yeah, and yeah, don't it. it's like, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. I love my books. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and other people should love my books also. Exactly. <laughs> For sure. All right. So, okay, we better, we better move on. I do want to talk to about ghosts. So are you still ghost writing now or have you, how many books have you, tell us about ghost writing. Let's start there. Like, yeah, sure. what does it mean um, so- and what have you done? Yeah, absolutely. So the way that I went about ghostwriting is um, I had the uh, fortunate ability to stay home with uh, my daughter after she was born. Um, And that lasted for about three months. And then I was like, I'm bored. I need to do something else. And at the time, I was still traditionally published. So there was a bit of a gap. Um, I believe one of my contracts was almost over and there was like not one coming up quite yet. So I talked to a friend of mine and uh, she is a ghostwriter. She makes, um, that's her full-time job. And um, she sort of mentioned it on Facebook and I asked her about it. And she said she worked on Upwork, uh, which is a freelance website for um, many different things. So I, you know, tried it out because I was just looking for quick money at the time. Um I learned it was much more than that. Um, so I had the the main thing I wanted to do initially was build up my credibility on the website. So I took some pretty bad jobs. Uh, they gave me five stars for it, but I, you know, they didn't pay very well. Um, so I started doing that, and then I landed um, a book packager and two really um, prolific clients. So these are sort of, I sign NDA, so I can't really talk about it too much, mm-hmm. but um, these are authors who publish under a name, but they have a team of ghostwriters. Mm-hmm. Um, and book packagers, they usually make it sometimes pretty obvious that they have ghostwriters. Um, but yeah, so I, I had that job sort of alongside um, staying home and um, dealing with my future contracts. What's a book packager? Yeah, what's a book packager? I've never heard that <laughs> oh, term before. Oh, uh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a book packager is basically um, like a company. It's it's a publisher typically, and they hire out like everything. So they have um, ideas for books that are marketable. So they have like a marketing team. Um, the one I worked with had like an outlining team, editors, writers, cover designers. So it's like, they have all these author names, but they don't, those people don't exist. It's just like a combined effort toward um, selling these books. So, mm-hmm. yeah. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. Yep. I, I realized, I, I, don't, I don't know if this is the same kind of thing, but my daughter has her favorite series called um, Zoe's Rescue Zoo. It's a kid's series. You know, when she was younger, she did. Mm-hmm. So when she was probably about eight or nine. And mm-hmm. And I think that one is definitely written by lots of different people. And it's a, yeah. and it, and I, when I looked at the website and I was kind of researching into it and stuff. And so is that kind mm-hmm. of the same sort of thing where they would, it would be like a publishing house and they have the series and they have this kind of name that it's all under, yeah. but it's, but it's clearly different. Yeah. Writing yeah. The different books. Um, exactly. Like, and, and it can come in different ways. Like, so James Patterson has ghostwriters, but he puts them on, he puts their name on the cover 
Whereas I didn't want my name on any of the covers and they never asked me if I did. So um, I just wrote for them. Um, and what was nice about that process is that like I would write and then just hand it off and they would just do everything else and I would get paid uh, wow. versus like self-publishing where you have to do all of the things. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's just, it's different. Yeah. Different for different things. Is it, are we talking like 50,000 word books or children's books or, you know, like are they ones that you'd have to spend a lot of time on or you just kind of whip them out? Well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was very much the, when I finally got to a comfortable place with my two clients, um, they had outlines prepared for me oh, and yeah. I could just write. Yeah. The ones that didn't have an outline, I would charge more because that's a lot more work to do up front, yeah. which I had mm -hmm. to learn the hard way and not getting paid a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, throughout the years, I just sort of figured out what I wanted to do. Yeah, And, and then of course I tried to do it all and um, yeah. you know, burned out. I burned out a lot actually. I learned my limits on how much I could write, um, you know, cause I would consistently write like 6,000 words a day for like months wow. at a time. Mm -hmm. And then I would burn out, I'd hurt my wrists. Um, and then I'd take a break and then do it all over again. So I really pushed myself to the limit to figure out where, where I was. Um, and in that industry specifically, at least with the people that I met, it's typically something they want quickly. It's a quick turnover. Um, so you sort of have to, to keep up if you want to work consistently. Mm. so are you like I'm still like is it a 50,000 word book that you have to write in two weeks or are you is it is there a time sometimes time? yeah okay. yeah it, it just depends like so one of my clients was uh middle is middle grade um so the books were a lot shorter mm. um so usually that was like a two three week per book um and then some that were a little longer maybe a month maybe five weeks mm. um yeah. So then when I worked for the book packager, we sort of came up with an ideal schedule um, because I had to like interview for that position and everything. And, I, and at that point I knew my limits. So I sort of inflated it a little bit, um, the timeline for myself. Yeah. Yeah. It makes That's sense. Point, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and are you okay? Like, um, how hard is it just to send off your book and to, and just let them go with it? Do you, is it, is there a pang or you're just like, no, this is fine. Yeah. I'm earning money for it's it. It's not my but, book. Yeah. Yeah they're, yeah. they're not my books. They're not my ideas. Uh, um, so, I mean, I'm just getting paid. It's like any other job. You just do it and you let it go. There's, there's not one of them that I was like upset about, <laughs> to be honest, I had no attachment. So do you see them out in the wild and you go, oh, that's interesting. Some of them. Yes. Yeah. yeah a lot of them were, um, like uh kindle unlimited kdp yeah. uh, books that are still out there yeah. um so yeah but i mean they're not something you would choose to write so i guess you there is that no attachment to it you know yeah yeah no and, and i understand yeah. i can understand as a ghostwriter like having mm -hmm. these conversations there are people who are like look at me like i have 10 heads like why would you ever <laughs> write a book yeah. for someone yeah. else and i'm like because i get paid in a month yeah. for yes. a whole book yes um versus waiting for royalties and waiting yeah. for all that stuff. Mm. So it's, it's just like any other thing. It's, I hire subcontractors with my work. They hire me yeah. to subcontract part yeah. of their work. That's so right. it's just, it's all a business and exchange. Mm. Yeah. So it's just a flat fee. There's no ongoing royalties in any way, shape or form. It's just no, none of the, none of the contracts I did. Um, I know some ghostwriters will do that. Um, to me, that's a little riskier just in mm. case like they don't market the book and yeah. you know mm. you know you just don't make enough money so I just I had my um per I think it was per thousand word fee um mm. when I was on Upwork so then they just understood up front what I was going to get paid mm. yeah, yeah. Actually, do you mind do you mind saying no, how much no, it was no. a book are we no sure. what is there no, an average don't. rate for um for ghostwriters or we don't it really depends. Um, I don't remember what my rate was, but um, it really depends because on these websites, you are sort of competing with people in different countries mm -hmm. and they yeah. charge like nothing. And it's like nothing I would even like apply for if that's what they yeah. were going to charge. So there's a little bit of, of that there too, but you know, yeah. it's all, it was all 
a game like that I had to play and figure out and then Mm. just chose my clients and stuck around with them because they were sending me all the outlines (laughs) yeah well that's that's good isn't it because clearly you you did well enough Mm. that you could Mm -hmm. then cherry pick your clients Mm. yeah exactly yeah and I think the thing you I don't know if you said it on here but you um you've got this post on YouTube that's one of your more popular ones it was about ghostwriting Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and it's yes. kind of because people think ghostwriting, I'm going to make all this money and it's going to be amazing mm-hmm. and it's going to be a get rich quick scheme. And it's really not. Mm-hmm. Is that would mm-hmm. is that fair to say? I mean, I would say at least in my case, it wasn't very quick. Um, because on those the way that I went, you know, I don't have an agent, so I'm not doing like um, you know, work for Disney or any of, of those with intellectual property. Um, it's definitely um yeah, it's it's not get rich quick at all. Like, yeah. you know, you have to make sure too when you're applying for jobs, like I said, if they're hiring out in other countries, like making sure that you get quality work. Mm. Um and you know, in the correct language that you wanna you wanna publish in. Um, so yeah, it's are you still yeah. are you still ghostwriting now or um I if I'm approached and I like the project, yes. Yeah. Um, but I'm not on Upwork anymore. It was just way too much. Yeah. Um, and with my full-time job, like that's one thing I had to let go. I mean, for my health, like my physical health with, yeah. with ghostwriting. Yeah. Um, but um, last year, I believe it was last year, I, I did a project with someone, uh, my first nonfiction. And that was a lot of fun uh, mm-hmm. because I got to do research and mm-hmm. hand off the book and get paid. So <laughs> even better. <laughs> Yes. It's all about balance, yeah. really, isn't it? Yeah, and it sounds like yes. you have a good balance and so far as you've got a whole lot of balls in the air, but you enjoy them all. Mm. So it's variety, yeah. and I mean, look, that, is a, yeah. that is key, isn't it, variety sometimes? Yes. Mm. Yeah. I like the idea of not awesome. doing the stuff you don't want to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. We it's all like, like that idea, too. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. That's cool. Is it? So yeah. I think we've kind of, we've, we've, Managed to squeeze all this information out of you, which I'm super excited about. (laughs) I wasn't sure I'd get through everything. Um, Is there any? Is there any kind of final things that you'd like to say to our audience, or any kind of pieces of advice that about being an author or self-publishing or being a hybrid publisher that you can? Um, I think in general, community is really important. Um, I didn't have that, that initially, and I think a lot of the I would say quote unquote mistakes were because I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, and I think we're in such an interesting age of sharing, um, sometimes oversharing, but, um, you know, sharing with each other and really putting trust in other authors and the community is so great, especially, um, with self-publishing, not to say trad isn't, but in my experience, um, self-published authors are way more open to giving, advice very Mm -hmm. honest advice about their experiences and I just absolutely love it so I would say try to find your community it doesn't have to be huge but um definitely it's it's made the process so much more fun um and has really pushed me because you know the people that I've become friends with um you know we always strive to continuously improve um with writing or marketing and things like that and it's always fun to do with friends Mm -hmm. yes great advice, actually yeah. yeah that's fantastic okay so yeah. where can you be found where, where can we find all of your things <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely so uh, my website uh caitlinduncan.com um also uh the course is at from chaos to control.com the two is the number two um i'm on youtube uh caitlin duncan's writing life and um, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook, uh, but typically YouTube is my big, my big platform. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And who wants to say where we can be found? Cheryl, maybe? Oh, Cheryl? Uh, we can be found at spagirlspodcast.com at all the places and especially at Patreon if you'd like to uh, support the show in any way to help us keep going and supplying this wonderful advice from people like Caitlin, then um, please join us on Patreon. And um, yeah, you can find That's us pretty everywhere. much it everywhere, yeah, everywhere, everywhere. Just everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Caitlin. We've learned heaps. It's been awesome. It's been fascinating. I've really enjoyed it. Mm. Um, and thank yeah. you to all of our listeners. 
um, who've come yep. along today to listen to the podcast or to watch us on YouTube. Hello, mm -hmm. if you're watching us on YouTube. <laughs> um, and that's us for now, though. Thank you so much. And we'll be back again next week. But farewell for now. Bye. 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 Bye.